Um, so good evening and welcome to our series of panel style Zoom presentations. Um, it's been interesting so far this year to recreate our in-person activities as virtual programs and I hope you've been enjoying them. Um, topics covered so far have included conversations featuring local farmers, chefs, and producers of specialty items, as well as the present and future of horticulture on Long Island and local artists' connection to conservation in their art. Um, but tonight we'll be hearing from three uh, scientists who specialize in researching ticks and helping to educate the public about their dangers, as well as ways to be safe while exploring nature. We thank you all for tuning in with us tonight and special thanks, of course, to our panelists and our moderator. I'm Kathy Kennedy and I'm with Laconic Land Trust and I hope that you're doing well and staying safe during these interesting times. Um, from all of us at the Trust, we wish you of course all the best and are grateful that you spent some time tonight to join with us. Um, on a housekeeping note where you are muted during the conversation, so at the end we'll be answering questions from the audience and so please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen to post a question and we will try to answer as many of them as possible at the end. A little bit about Peconic Land Trust. Um, as you know, the trust was founded in 1983 with a mission to conserve Long Island's working farms, natural lands and heritage. And with your help, as well as the support of thousands of individuals, partners, um, partner organizations, foundations, community groups, um, all levels of government really, we've been able to accomplish a lot. We've protected over 13,000 acres of Long Island excuse me, of land on Long Island, including thousands of acres of natural lands, wetlands, shorelines, meadows, woodlands, forests, even a public garden that all provide for respite, habitat for wildlife and protection of our water for drinking, fishing, aquaculture and recreation. Um, in addition with your support, we've helped conserve over 6,000 acres of farmland that is available to farmers growing food and many other agricultural products on Long Island. So all of this and more we're able to do every day with your support and we thank you so much. Thanks. Um, today's panel features dedicated and hardworking scientists who have studied ticks, their habitat and the impact they have on public health. We're happy to have Moses Cesara, entomologist with Suffolk County Vector Control, Dan Gilrain, entomologist with Cornell Cooperative Extension of Suffolk County, and Tamson Ye, pest management and turf specialist with Cornell Cooperative Extension of Suffolk County. Our wonderful moderator for tonight's program is Melissa Perrot, Director of Environmental Education and Outreach with the Central Pine Barrens Commission. Melissa has been in the environmental education field for over 25 years. Originally from California, she received her degree at California State University in Long Beach. She's been the Education and Outreach Coordinator for the Central Pine Barrens Commission since 2007. And prior to that, Melissa was the Director of Environmental Education for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and Education Coordinator with Cornell Cooperative Extension, Sweetbriar Nature Center, and the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. Wow. She's also the Executive Director and Founder of Students for Climate Action, a nonpartisan climate action committee that mobilizes students to engage elected officials on climate and be a part of the solution. Uh, by supporting climate policies and 100% renewable energy initiatives. Um, so before I turn the program over to Melissa, a final reminder on the Q&A. Please use the button at the bottom of the screen to pose a question. And we will be turning to the questions at the end of our formal program. And with that, I turn it over to Melissa Parat with our sincere thanks. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me. I was very excited to be part of this most interesting conversation and to learn along with the audience so much about ticks. Just a quick anecdote about myself and why I'm moderating this presentation is I work closely with Tamson, who's one of your panelists um, today. And oh boy, is she just this wealth of information. I work a lot with uh, the general public and students and youth with my camp. And I come across a lot of families that don't wanna go outside and participate because they their fear of ticks. So I feel it's all of our responsibility to kind of quelch that fear and instead learn and educate yourself on the ticks and how to be safe from this the ticks. And that's really what I do. In fact, the, uh, that lit roller has become my best friend whenever I'm out amongst um, my walks and hikes um, in the Pine Barren. So it's, it's quite um, good information to have. So I wanna thank um, you all for allowing me to be part of this. And without further ado, Dan Gilrain, if you'd like to start the presentation. Okay. Uh, the panelist will uh, speak for about 15 minutes and then we'll do the Q&A at the end. 
Okay, very good. And uh, let's see, can you see my screen here? Yes, I can see it. Very good. Okay, wonderful. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us this evening and I hope we are not going to spoil your dinner um, by discussing ticks. Um, and I will tell you that uh, this is, of course, as you know, a real a big issue for us here on Long Island. Um, but I still do enjoy very much going out and enjoying nature, and I do not let ticks get in my the way of that. And so I hope you won't either, but uh, with some of the information we provide, you can protect yourself. And knowing more and understanding more is really, uh, I think, the key to, to all of this. So let's talk about uh, some of the ticks that we've, uh, we're seeing on Long Island. Uh, we'll get to know them a little bit better. This, of course, is the kind of thing that people are encountering and are getting concerned about. You go out in the field, you think you're going to enjoy yourself on a nice hike, and you're not alone. Um, and these uh, ticks have just one thing on their minds, and that's you, uh, and that's not really a good thing. So they really get in the way of enjoyment. Um, this is another thing people are experiencing, and these are actually ticks as well. This is actually the immature stage or the larval stage, the tiniest stage uh, that hatched from eggs uh, of Lone Star ticks. Um, and this is what people have been encountering a lot in the field uh, when they're hiking in Pine Barrens and other areas, um, uh, in the grassy areas, even in wooded areas and all, all sorts of places. So these are often mistaken for chiggers, but they're not. These are actually Lone Star tick larvae. And when they bite, they're very, very itchy. So they can be really, really annoying and they uh, really spoil your enjoyment. Here's a close-up of what that looks like. This is a sample that was submitted to me, someone who had been out in the uh, Pine Barrens and hiking and was distressed to find all of these tiny little things biting her and a lot of them on her sock. And I explained to her that these are the, the larval stage, the immature stage of Lone Star ticks. This is what you end up with when they bite are these lesions that are very, very itchy. Uh, you may get blisters and they, the itching persists for a long time, maybe a week or two. And it's rather, rather disturbing. So it's something we'd really like to avoid and it's possible to avoid all that. I think a lot of the concern arises certainly because of the diseases associated with ticks. So they can transmit a number of pathogens and the diseases that they can cause are listed on the left. And you can see a lot of the colors are concentrated in the Northeast, especially right over Long Island where you can't even see them all because they're all obliterated by obliterating each other. And so that's uh, really a, a concern because of the potential for disease transmission. And it's very real and we need to take that extremely seriously. Uh, so the, there's three main ticks that bother us and that it's important to know about and recognize and understand that's fun, fundamental to understanding how to protect yourself uh, when and how and, 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 and where. And the first one I want to talk about is this black-legged deer tick. This is pretty widespread around the Northeast and certainly here on Long Island. This is a denizen of the of wooded and shaded areas primarily. It doesn't like to be in open sunny sites, um, but you can sometimes find them in those areas. But primarily it likes to be in shady uh, woodland kind of areas. And they come in different stages. A lot of people are not aware that ticks uh, are not all large, that they uh, have these smaller stages. And that is what makes them so insidious transmitters of disease because you may not know you've been bitten by one of these smaller stages that could be carrying one of these pathogens. So here in this picture, you'll see in the center, there's an adult male on the left and a female on the right. And in the lower left of my finger, there's one of the females. She has kind of a, uh, these black legs, but also a reddish abdomen or uh, be, uh, uh, aft section of her body. On the upper right is a tiny nymph. This is the stage before the adults um, and after these nymphs, uh, that the one that's stuck to my finger is a nymph, after they get a blood meal it will molt to an adult later on. And it's these nymphs that are often undetected. You don't often realize you've even been bitten by them but they still can carry some of these pathogens and that's a big reason why some people are getting sick. And on the lower right middle it's uh, not a very good picture but there's uh, the larval stage. Uh, this is the stage that hatched from the egg. And between each of these stages, they need to get a blood meal before they advance further. Um, so these are all the, the stages of the black-legged or deer tick, this very, very common one here. This is the Lone Star tick. This is even more common. And these like not just shaded areas, but they'll be out in sunnier sites and you'll even get them in lawns and, and many, many places. Uh, the upper left is the female, which has that distinctive white spot. So most people think that all Lone Star ticks have that white spot. Well, they don't. The one on the lower right is a male and you can see the males do not have that white spot. So these are both adults. In the center of the 
of the slide, you'll see that there's nymphs and larvae. These are immature stages. The tiniest larvae, the ones that I was showing on the sock earlier, and these have hatched from an egg, often a cluster, and they'll um, get on you often in this kind of a cluster so you can get even hundreds of them on you at, at one time from this one egg mass that a female had laid. After they have a blood meal, they will molt into this nymph stage. So you can see one in the center there, and that's a little bit larger. And then after that has a blood meal, it'll then molt to the adult. Uh, and you see the adult male and females I'm showing there. The third tick we have is this American dog tick, and this is the male and the female in, in the center of the picture there, and a female that's questing on a grass blade on the upper left. Um, these I often see around uh, woodland edges or areas that have some shrubbery, um, often because the hosts that they like live in those areas. I, I'm not showing the immature stages of these, mostly because they don't seem to be interested in humans, not very often anyway, and I've only rarely, if ever, encountered them. So the ones you'll see of this particular tick are these adult stages, pretty much. Um, Lone Star ticks and other ticks are uh, an issue here because of the wildlife hosts that they feed upon. And Lone Star ticks in particular are very abundant because their primary host are, are deer. And you can see many of them on the ears of a deer on the right there. And on the upper left, there's a lot of engorged females that are feeding on the ear of that deer. So we have a lot of ticks because of the wildlife population that serve as their hosts. And we have a really large number of Lone Stars because of the rising and uh, and high already population of deer that are present here. This is a slide that gives you a sense for the host associations of these ticks and for the stages of these ticks, whether they're larvae or nymphs or adults uh, and the host that they're most associated with. I think the most uh, important takeaway is that the older, the larger ticks, the adult tick stages are gonna be mostly associated with larger animals. Uh, and uh, that puts uh, us in that category also. Uh, that's why they're interested in us. But uh, so these other stages have their also their associations. So it gets a little complicated, but this kind of summarizes it for you to give you a sense for how it's all how it all works together. Now the pathogens, uh, these are the organisms that cause disease. These also have their associations. And the interesting thing is that these pathogens need to live somewhere. They need to have a home and a residence. And those residences are in wildlife primarily. And so I'm showing where these different pathogens uh, normally reside. So for example, in the center of this chart, I mentioned Lyme disease. It's caused by the pathogen, the uh, bacterium called Borrelia burgdorferi. And and the black leg tick is its vector and it mainly likes to live in rodents. So you hear about white-footed mice. And so what you're wondering, what is this all about white-footed mice and Lyme disease and uh, ticks? Well, that's what it's all about is that um, the pathogen that causes Lyme disease uh, likes to reside and serves and is a reservoir in rodents, specifically white-footed mice, chipmunks and some others. Um, so you can see the different associations that are here. Um, Lone Star tick stands out as the only one on this list um, and it's the reservoir and the reservoir for ehrlichiosis is in deer and Lone Star tick can transmit the pathogen that causes ehrlichiosis. So this kind of gives you a quick summary of what these associations are all about. So it can get easily very confusing, but this helps hopefully boil it down for you. So there's things you can do to protect yourself and Tamsin will talk about that and Moses as well in a moment. Um, and uh, one thing you can do if you'd like to find out how many ticks or whether there are ticks on your property is to do some flagging on your own. And this is one of our employees at one point that was doing flagging and checking for ticks. The ticks will think there's an animal going by and cling onto the cloth and then you can lift that up and check to see if you have ticks in the area. And it's a simple way to do that. Um, so this is just some of the, so one way you can check even on your own property to see if there's ticks around. It's pretty simple to do. Once you recognize them, they're, they're pretty easy to, to find. Um, and this is some data that Moses generated who's been uh, responsible for our tick surveillance program in Suffolk County. Uh, to basically showing you that there's tick stages around almost all year, pretty much all year, depending of course on weather conditions, but you can find adults at different times of the year and you can find nymphs at different times of the year. And in particular on the right there, you'll see that um, reddish line of the, of the deer tick. These are the deer tick nymphs that are active in the spring. This is about the time that people like to get out of their house. They're already overly confined and they want to get out in the spring, nice weather. And so that's when they're going to be most likely encountering these nymph ticks that are also 
uh, very, very difficult to detect, but they could be carrying uh, some of these pathogens. And this is probably the reason why people are getting Lyme disease is because they're getting out and not detecting when they've been bitten by one of these nymphs. But this uh, helps you understand uh, when the periods of risk could be and uh, get, help you uh, uh, respond accordingly. Uh, ticks have a rather complicated life cycle I don't really want to go into, but it takes about two years for them to go through that. And the result of that is that you can have, as again, I went pointing out here, you can have these different stages around at different times. Uh, and this just gives you a sense for the, uh, uh, the deer ticks that are active, the different stages at different times of the year. And those red bars are showing when the nymphs are out. And that's one of the periods, I think, when it's most important to be aware of them and to protect yourself against, um, against them. Um, just a few websites, and these will be provided later on. These are some really interesting ones, the Connecticut Tick Management Handbook, the um, tick surveillance program that Moses oversees, some information uh, about the pathogens, that the, the organisms that cause disease that they've been finding, a uh, website from the Health Department on ticks and tick-borne diseases, and some really excellent uh, archived and right now ongoing presentations on ticks through U, uh, UMass, and you can link to those and join them live or get them recorded later on. So these uh, websites and links will be provided later on. I encourage you to check them out and learn some more. Uh, now I'd like to turn this over to Moses, who is the tick entomologist with the uh, Suffolk County uh, uh, Department of Public Works uh, Vector Control Division. And he's uh, going to talk to you a little bit more about some of the work that he's been involved with. Great. Thank you, Dan. Appreciate it. Uh, so now that we've had a great introduction to what ticks we encounter here on Long Island, um, I'm basically going to jump into why they're here in a little bit more detail. Uh, so we, we can jump to the, uh, the next slide. So uh, this was a photo taken locally, actually, um, right around here on Long Island. And I'm sure a lot of you have, that have property that back up to the woods or some wilderness areas, this, this is a fairly common sight. Um, so the deer are why we have tick issues throughout the northeastern United States. Um, uh, next. And we don't just have one version of the white-tailed deer. There is actually some very beautiful variation on these animals locally. So you can see we have some piebald varieties with the, the white and the, the brownish white coloring. And then we also have another species called the Sika deer. Um, they're a bit smaller, and uh, I believe that that photo was taken around the Brookhaven area. Mm -hmm. um, so we do have a couple different species that we deal with locally here. Um, so for the biology, uh, so next, please. Thank you. Um, biggest thing about the deer is currently they're very widespread. Uh, they're highly adaptable, and they become accustomed to humans. Just like most of us who've gone into any of the beaches here, um, especially Robert Moses, you'll see the deer come out to the cars because they're used to being fed. They habituate very easily. They adapt very easily. Um, and since they don't have any local predators anymore, unfortunately, um, the vehicles that we drive are legitimately the largest predatory influence on the population at this time. Uh, so their population is just continues to grow unchecked. Um, they are very prolific at um, populating, and a single female generally can have um, two fawns every year. And again, due to the lack of predators, we can have some individual deer um, that I've aged myself that have been 15 and up to 20 years. So that's a single female um, that can give potentially two fawns every year for 15 to 20 years. Uh, so you can see that they have the ability to rebound a population very quickly and functionally they can double it every two years. Uh, next. So as we mentioned, they are adaptable. If there's a food source and they're hungry enough, they will get to it. So the um, concept of deer resistant plants, um, it, it varies very widely as far as how well it works here on the island. Um, one of the best things you can have on your property if you don't believe you have deer yet is actually to plant hostas. So hosta is also known as deer candy. Um, they can be a sentinel plant. If you don't think you have deer, plant hostas. If you notice they disappear, <laughs> you have deer. So that's one great way to check to see if they are coming onto your property. Um, 
And then if you continue to work out east or you're closer to some of the wilderness areas, you'll see the browse lines on your plants. You'll see um, the damage from the um, overabundance that we have. Uh, next. So the forests that we have here on Long Island, the wilderness areas, um, unfortunately, they're, they're at a rather severely overbrowsed state because of the overpopulated deer um, issue. Now, these are just some photos that represent our local woodlands here. And generally, when you have um, too, uh, too high of a deer population, like we currently do, um, you tend to see a very small or no younger age cohort of trees growing up in the canopy. So you see some smaller individuals that are out of reach of the deer, but the majority of them are older trees. Uh, so you have maybe two or three older cohorts. So when we have storm damage, like when we've had a lot recently, um, it takes these woodland areas much longer to functionally recover because the younger trees don't have the ability to actually grow up and get out of that herbivory range from the deer. So it, it takes longer for our forest to recover. Next. So I, I wanted to jump in on the deer item here because um, deer, as I mentioned before, are the reason why we have tick issues. Now, a nice study that was done locally at Seatuck National Wildlife Refuge, um, they trapped pretty much every animal that they could potentially could within uh, the reserve there. And out of all the animals they recovered, which included dogs, cats, raccoons, squirrels, uh, various bird species and other ground dwelling um, mammals, 93% um, of those ticks were found on the deer that they, um, that the deer, the deer that they trapped from the refuge. Now, if you look at um, the variation in ticks from male to female deer, there was another very interesting thing. Um, they found that male deer actually had three times as many ticks generally feeding on them as female deer. And that tends to be because the um, male rut season, when they become more aggressive and they search out of their or normal host range during mating season, takes place in the fall, um, around the same time that adult deer ticks become very active. So the male deer are traveling further, they're encountering more of these brushy areas where the ticks quest, um, so it makes sense that they encounter more ticks. Um, also a very interesting thing that this um, study found was the domestic cats that they found on the um, refuge itself. They only found, if I remember correctly, it was between six and eight cats. And I believe it was around 60 deer. Uh, but those six to eight cats that they found um, had 3.8% of the total ticks on them. And when they kept all of these ticks and allowed them to lay um, egg masses and let the egg masses rear out, um, the, uh, the functional quality of the host was the same as a white-tailed deer. Now the host quality is the reason why adult ticks focus on deer and other large animals. If they are forced to feed on a smaller animal, they tend to have smaller egg clutches and um, fewer and fewer of the larvae will survive. So the fact that cats were as efficient as a host, as a white-tailed deer, uh, was very interesting as we do have a fairly large um, feral cat population locally as well. Uh, next. So now we're gonna jump onto some of the ways we can manage ticks. Um, this is a, uh, device that targets the white-footed mouse, which Dan brought up earlier. So um, the white-footed mouse, again, is the primary host for the smaller stage of the deer tick, the larva and the nymphs, and they're also the one that uh, the um, ticks can pick Lyme disease up from. So this device you can place around your property or a pest control operator can place it around your property. The mice use the cotton and bring it back to their nest. And the cotton itself is treated with a material called permethrin. Uh, which is the same material um, I use to treat my clothing when I go out in the field. And they uh, nest in that material and it kills the ticks that are feeding on the mice topically. So this has been shown to control the ticks very well on the mouse itself, um, but it, it has had some difficulty reducing the tick population on its own within properties. So um, this is an item that can be used, um, but it should be used in association with the secondary or another um, tick management strategy. And um, another note, a big note, if you're dealing with Lone Star ticks or American dog ticks, this particular product won't be able to help you as those ticks uh, don't 
functionally feed on white-footed mice enough um, to make a, a dent in the population. Next. So uh, here's another um, host base. Um, uh, so this one is for white-footed mice, other species of mice, and chipmunks. It operates similarly to the other product, um, except there's two small uh, cloth wicks inside. And when the uh, rodent goes inside to go after the nice tasty bait in there, they rub up against the wick and their fur gets treated with a, um, it's called tau uh, fluvalinate, which is a similar product to permethrin. Um, so that treats their fur just like the cotton was treated in the last device. And um, that has been shown to control ticks very well on the animals that use the device. And it has had some effect on reducing local tick populations on the properties um, that install these devices. Um, so this is a, a good option. Um, it is one of the more expensive options. And you do have to have a certified pest control operator um, put them on the property. So unfortunately, this is not something that homeowners themselves um, can install. Uh, but it it is a good potential product to use for deer ticks. Uh, for again, for Lone Star ticks and American dog ticks, unfortunately this product won't be able to help you. Uh, next. Uh, so I'm just gonna use this figure quickly um, just so we have a, a concept for our next um, discussion on barrier treatments with different pesticide products. Uh, Tamsin will be going over the vegetation management side of this um, during her portion. So you can see around the house, they have the, the shrub area with um, you know, your edging in place and your mulch. And then around the outside of the property, they have something similar. And if you look at that dotted line there, they have a three yard tick mitigation zone. So that's the area you would treat uh, with a, a typical um, permethrin product or a natural product um, to minimize the ticks from working their way into the high use areas of the property so the high use areas of the property would be areas where you, um, your children, your dogs, where you spend your time. So that would be the garden, the swing set, the deck. Um, if you have a barbecue out back, it could be around there. Um, and one item that is usually often, on, on, it's, uh, it's often forgotten, unfortunately, is your mailbox. So when I was in the private industry, um, we used to get a lot of calls from homeowners that would pick up ticks when they went to get their mail because generally you see a mailbox, they have an ornamental planting right near them, or in some cases, the mailbox is actually in the planting. So um, it's, it's a perfect place for a tick to quest. So um, if you are looking at having your property uh, managed for ticks, you wanna make sure those areas are treated with these same products as well. So you wanna do that mitigation zone around the outside border of your property. All of the um, hedges or ornamental plantings around the base of your home because you will have small rodent and bird activity there that will lure ticks and um, drop ticks off at those locations and any other high use areas. Next. So um, we just went over the visual component for a barrier application. So um, some basics about the different type of products. So you have uh, commercial products that pest control operators can apply. Then you have homeowner products that you or I can attach to a hose and go do the treatments. Um, from a, a general standpoint, the commercial products will have um, a longer period of efficacy in the field um, than the homeowner based products. Now, that being said, um, you don't want to use barrier applications with any product um, on their own. You should always manage six with two or potentially three uh, mitigation efforts at the same time. So that way you basically have a synergistic effect and you can uh, minimize the intensity of all three or all two of those management strategies. So um, you get increased efficacy while also reducing the amount of uh, pesticide you have to apply or vegetation management you have to do um, or you know, other things like that. So you always wanna have more than one approach when you're managing ticks. Uh, so yeah, yeah, so we can pop on to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so one thing we've done um, at Suffolk County at Vector Control is we took a look at quite a few of the uh, commercial products that have been on the market at this time. And we took a really uh, detailed look at these products, including some of the more common and um, the, uh, well, basically the natural oil or the 25B exempt products that are becoming more and more popular. Um, they are brought onto market market in a way where there's not 
a lot of uh, rigorous testing. So the data behind those particular products is generally laboratory based. And there's only a handful of field based studies uh, that uh, report the efficacy levels um, on ticks. So we thought it would be very valuable uh, for everybody on Long Island and for our program you know, in particular to take a look at those products and compare them to the commercial ones as well. So uh, next. One of the ways we did that uh, was we figured out a way to actually enhance our ability to track ticks in the environment. So Dan showed a great um, photo earlier of flagging where you drag the wet cloth through the woods and the ticks latch onto that as they go through. What we did with our arenas was we had a captive population and we actually color coded them. And if you look closely on the leaf, you can see red, yellows, blues, and there are uh, white ticks in there as well. So we color coded the ticks so we could keep better track of them um, as we recovered them from the experimental arenas. Uh, next slide. And because our recovery uh, was so high, we found some really neat things like we found um, instances of opportunistic predation where other organisms in, uh, such as millipedes or beetles in the soil in the leaf litter were actually preying on the ticks that were in those arenas. So this is a photo of a female lone star tick. Um, you can see a little bit of the residual powder on the tick itself, but you can see that um, something made a meal. And this is, this is not very well documented in the scientific literature. So we, we, found, we just thought it was really interesting. Um, so, and we, we have seen some other instances where local ant species have actually went into our arenas and completely cleared out all the ticks. Mm. So there are instances where we do have local insect um, and potentially other organisms that will opportunistically prey on these ticks. Um, but unfortunately, it does appear that it's not enough to reduce population where they need to be on their own. So uh, next. Another really interesting thing that we saw uh, was overhydration. So when um, I do my field surveillance, I'm out all year. Um, I was actually out this morning um, at Meadowlark Park. Um, I found quite a few larvae. <laughs> um, so one thing I noticed, if I would go out and do uh, tick flagging, after a rain or after two or three days of rain, I never really got too many ticks. And when we started examining the, um, the data from our field arenas, we noticed that the ticks themselves were actually becoming overhydrated after a day of heavy rain or two or three days of consecutive lighter rains. So as you can see here, these ticks, um, they are the one in the middle and the one on the right are slightly overhydrated. The one on the left um, is at a normal status where it can quest on its own without issue. The other two, um, they're actually, well, the, the one in the middle on its own, they have difficulty grabbing onto objects. So they, they wouldn't even be able to crawl up um, your pant leg or onto your sock, they would likely fall off. And then the one uh, all the way to the right, uh, that one is so overhydrated, it would not move from underneath the leaf litter. So um, we can take a better look at this on the, the next slide where we actually recorded um, the tick activity in response to tip to different rain events during a field trial. So um, the shadowed boxes on this represent different rain events. So as you can see on day three and four, we had two relatively minor rain events. And then on day five, we had a, a fairly, um, fairly significant rain event where we had 0.6 inches of rain. And if you look at the black and green line, uh, which is the questing population within our arenas, you see that after that heavy rain event, the number of questing tick, um, ticks drops uh, rather quickly. And then we went out on day six, um, we had a minor rain event later on that day. Um, we also recovered more overhydrated individuals in those same arenas. So as we had more rain, we had less questing activity and more overhydrated ticks that themselves could not quest. And when we brought these arenas inside and let them dry it out, all of those ticks came right back um, as far as their ability to quest and search for a host. So uh, for those of one key component of this, those of us who like to be outdoors, um, one of the best times to take a walk or bring your dog on, on to any of the parks is actually a day after a heavy rain because your tick activity is going to be lowest at that point, uh, no matter what time of the year it is. So uh, that's generally when I take my dog out to the parks is a day after a heavy rain. So, but um, in those instances, you still should use personal protection. And that's another thing um, Tamsin will go over later. 
Next, please. Great. So um, this is some of the actual data that we recovered from our arena-based uh, studies. So in this one, we tested four different products. Um, the red bar is um, Maverick Perimeter. So that's a synthetic pyrethroid similar to permethrin, which we talked about earlier. Um, then we have uh, Tall Star, which is the purple. That's a granular product. Um, the Tall Star is bifenthrin. Again, it's a synthetic pyrethroid. Uh, Maverick is a liquid formulation. And then the purple is a granular. Then the blue product is a Century IC3. That's a rosemary or a natural oil-based product. And then the Cedar Safe is a cedar oil-based product, another um, natural product or 25B exempt. So for deer tick adults, um, which these results are for, you can see that the two synthetic pyrethroids, Maverick and Telstar, uh, worked fairly well. Um, over the 12-day trial, they both reached around 80% control, or uh, I think it was 75 or um, something like that for Telstar. But it was, uh, they did very well. Now the natural oil products, uh, you can see that the Accentria IC3 in itself, it, it didn't even achieve 10% control, whereas the Cedar Safe um, was able to top out at around 33%. So um, this is due to the time of year that these ticks are active. It's late in the fall, you have colder temperatures, and the way that these natural products work is they basically they vaporize very quickly, overwhelm the tick, and uh, then within 24 hours or at a maximum two days, they have no more um, ability to reduce tick populations. They may still smell and be locally in the area, uh, but you're not going to have any residual control. So under colder temperatures, um, certain products are going to vaporize faster than others. So in this instance, the Century IC3 actually um, it vaporized uh, differently than the Cedar Safe. So that's why we saw less control on the deer tick adults. Now, if we look at the deer tick nymphs on the next slide, uh, you can see it's, it's quite a bit different. Now, this trial is done in the June, July time period because that's when the deer tick nymphs are uh, most active locally. So you can see the Maverick and the Tall Star, the synthetic pyrethroids, they did, both did fairly well. We were around 65% and a little over 70 for those products. And then the Accentria IC3 was a little over 40% and Cedar Safe actually um, achieved over 50% control. So the natural oil products apparently uh, perform better during warmer temperatures. So because they, they volatilize quicker and they're able to overwhelm the host locally so they have more of an effect. So um, they do seem to have some uh, use within uh, managing ticks, whether it be in a commercial application or um, in a homeowner-based product. So for any of the 25B products, I would say uh, go for it in the June and July time period. But once you get your colder temperatures um, past September, um, if, if you really insist on using a 25B product, I would recommend one with a cedar oil base. Um, and use your rosemary-based products just in warmer weather. Now, the, um, the synthetic pyrethroids, uh, they worked fairly well at any time of year. So if you're looking for something that's going to give you a guaranteed or more of a guaranteed knockdown, you'll be using a synthetic pyrethroid. The 25B products do have an, um, a fairly high rate of natural variability. So we saw some replicates with higher mortalities and other with lower. So these are the averages we saw across the study. So um, all in all, the, the two products do have some potential to be used for deer ticks. So if we look at uh, Lone Star adults on the next slide, thank you. So you can see um, we had a little bit different results here. Same product, same rate, um, but uh, the Lone Star adults themselves, um, they're actually a bit, uh, tougher compared to the deer ticks. So they have a much thicker waxier cuticle. They, um, they don't dry out as easily as the deer ticks and they don't have to dig under the leaf litter to rehydrate as often. So um, functionally what that means is the granular product, the, the tall star, the purple bar, that product settles out underneath the leaf litter on top of the soil. If the ticks don't have to go to that area to rehydrate, uh, it's not, they're not going to come in contact with it. So what we noticed was uh, you want to use a, um, a liquid um, synthetic pyrethroid like the Maverick for control for Lone Star adults. And for the Accentria and Cedar Safe product, uh, we saw around 40% for the Accentria IC3 
and almost 30% for the Cedar Safe. So we still have some potential for controls from those products, uh, but again, there is more variability. And then if we look at the Lone Star um, NIMS, so we'll, yep, so thank you. So for the Lone Star NIMS, it was very similar. You can see that the Tall Star itself had some difficulty in controlling uh, the, lone, the Lone Star NIMS again, because it settled out below the leaf litter and that's not where that tick spends most of its time. Uh, they're more aggressive than the deer ticks. They spend a lot of time questing. And I've actually had them chase me for over 60 feet on a sandy trail on an 80 degree day in full sun. Yikes. So they are completely different than deer ticks. So the, one of the biggest takeaways um, from these few slides is you need to know what species you're dealing with in order to properly manage them. Lone stars are much more aggressive um, deer ticks, they'll only move two or three feet before they give up and go back to the secluded area that they were questing in. So, um, but uh, again, going back to this slide, so with the Lone Star Nymphs, the granular product worked okay. The liquid synthetic pyrethroid worked fairly well, almost 70% control, and the two natural oil products um, evened out between 45 and 50%. So um, all in all, the range of products that we tested do have some potential to control the different stages and species of ticks we encounter here on Long Island. Uh, but you really should know the species of tick you're dealing with so you can choose the proper formulation and type of product to go along with your other tick management strategies on the property. Uh, so, um, yeah, so the next slide just shows the actual percentages in case anyone uh, wanted to look at that later. Um, but at this point, I will actually um, uh, give it to Tamsin Ye for the next section. Um, so she will be going over quite a few other um, great items uh, regarding ticks. So uh, here's Tamsin. Great. Let me just get my uh, lecture up here. Let me try and share the screen. And it's raining in case you need to run and roll up your windows. And I'll go from the beginning, slideshow from the beginning. Go ahead. Okay, so one of the shrubs you never, ever want to plant anyway because it's invasive is Japanese barberry. It has an umbrella shape and it allows humidity to hang out underneath the shrub. And basically those darn ticks can do their thing and quest all day long. So yank them out and you can see this shrub is just said, Patooey! and spit out its ticks. But anyway, the other thing that happens when you have shrubs, especially along the foundation or you have ground covers, is the rodents tend to congregate there. They're having a good old party. And of course, wherever your rodents are congregating, you're going to have a certain percentage of ticks. And Melissa, just give me the cut sign when we need to so we can get right back on track. If we're off track, I don't even know what time it is. Uh, there's another thing you need to pay attention to, and that is bird feeder hygiene. Who knew there was such a topic? But rats and other rodents and mice and white-footed mice and deer both love bird feeders because it's tasty, but birds are messy eaters. You know, they're picking through the seed, they're throwing everything on the ground, and that's where the deer are going to come in and drop their little ticks, and also the rodents are going to come in and really enjoy that. So you need to clean up under the feeders quite a bit. And people also love to make a little bird habitat. So you've got all sorts of rodents, like the squirrels, which are associated with your lone star ticks. There's some nasty seed hanging out underneath there. So you really want to pay very good attention to what you've got going on, especially if you have chipmunks in the area. Are chipmunks the secret enemy? I think they are. Disney doesn't believe it, but I certainly do. They're very verminous. They don't clean themselves well. And the other weird thing about chipmunks in your yard is that they don't tend to go very far from where they are nesting, like along a fallen log, etc. And that's where deer ticks really like to hang out. They don't go very far either. So watch your chipmunks. That chipmunk's not happy with me because I included him in my lecture. And here are some perfect areas for rodents and birds to hang out together with a feeder, watch it because you don't want to create the perfect storm. There's some fallen logs there. We got the bird feeders there. And obviously, I'm obsessed with that. Now, there's a tick checklist that you can take around your home. You want to look for rock walls, especially shaded and overgrown with grass or brush. You want to look around wood piles. You want to look around long grass or shrubs with limbs that are about 18 inches long, which is tick questing height. That's deer belly height. So they're sort of 
waving around, you know, like they're at a sports thing, and then they hang on to whoever walks by. You want to look for areas where deer have a thoroughfare or they're bedding down at night, and you want to look at your ground covers like Liriope and Pakistander, Ivy and Vinca to see if the rodents are hanging out in there. Also, don't fertilize your trees and shrubs uh, in too heavily or at all because, of course, the deer are going to prefer that, and the deer are bringing in the lone star ticks, which are the most common tick on Long Island. Watch out for your water sources too, because of course rodents and deer both like that, especially if we have a drought and they may be bringing in the tick load. Um, pine litter, rodents use that, and areas that are heavily frequented by small mammals will also bring in the ticks. Or areas that are frequented by pets, and also areas that are perpetually damp or over irrigated. We uh, he heard from Dan and Moses about the importance of moisture for the ticks. Don't add to that issue. That will also add to your mosquito load, obviously. And then other leaf piles and leaf litter, etc. Great for um, rodents, great for deer, and also great for ticks. And blah blah blah. There's a whole long list. You can get this little. Uh, piece of paper from us if you like, but it helps you to kind of do a check off wherever you are in your yard. Now, safe tick removal, that is obviously a fake picture. That is one swollen tick, but it gives you the idea of what you ought to be doing when you're removing ticks. You want your tweezers, and I have curved ones here, don't pay attention to that. You want them to be perpendicular to the tick, you want to slide one arm of the tweezers underneath the tick and then the other arm over its back, get as close to the head as you possibly can, rotate 45 degrees and pull slowly and steadily backwards. You never thought you'd see geometry again, there's a triangle. Okay, and when you do that, those backward facing barbs, which look like a fish hook, will usually let go. Don't harass the tick by trying to paint it or burn it out or anything like that. You are likely to cause the tick to either um, release whatever it has inside it into your bloodstream or you're going to end up with a situation that you're not going to be happy with. All right, let's talk repellents, which are not what you think. You can't take a couple of lavender dryer sheets and stuff them in your pocket and think you're protected. You'll smell nice, but you're not protected against ticks. Tick-borne diseases are preventable. If the ticks don't bite you, you can't get sick. So that means that you need to take the um, initiative to put on a repellent in some way or some form. And there are a lot of things that affect how well repellents work. The one thing that always gets me is the higher temperatures. Each increase of 18 degrees, which is not hard to imagine if you start the day at 50 and it gets up to 68, can lead to as much as a 50% reduction in your protection time. Also, your repellents, even if they have the same active ingredient, they may be formulated differently or have different percentages. So really, what you need to do is you need to have a way to vet your repellents. So don't purchase your repellents based on the brand name. What you want to do is the active ingredient. And I'm going to show you some pictures. But the first thing I want to tell you about is to go to the EPA database. Well, no, I'll tell you about this first. I lie. I always lie on Thursdays, so you can take that as a precautionary thing. You want to buy your repellent by this tiny, tiny, tiny print all the way down at the bottom of the front of the can. You need seven pairs of glasses from the dollar store to read it, but it's very important. I have the EPA registration number circled on the orange product, and I actually have the active ingredient circled on the green product. That's really what's going to tell you what your product is, is doing with its chemistry, and it's also going to allow you to look it up on this handy dandy EPA database, which I'll show you in a minute. Also, never get products that are combination sunscreen and repellent because they will sort of cancel each other out and they won't work, won't work as well. Apply your sunscreen first and then your insect or tick repellent based on the manufacturer's instructions. Okay, so how do they stack up? Here's a simple trick for determining how well your repellent will work. Do a double Google on the internet, doing EPA repellent, search, and you'll find something that says find a repellent that is right for you. And there is that website. And you can click and download the entire database, which is a whopping 36 pages. It's not very long. And that's what it looks like when you do the double Google. And that's what the header page looks like. If you go all the way to the bottom, you can click 
on down here, export the entire insect repellent data set in PDF format. And what it will do is it will give you a list that looks something like this. Now, sometimes DEET, which is the active ingredient that's the gold standard for mosquitoes, doesn't work as well against ticks as you might expect. So you can look for ingredients called Picardin or IR3535. And again, remember that it is right at the bottom of the front of the can. When you look at this database, you'll see the name of the product, the percentage of active ingredient, and then it tells you how many hours the product is supposed to work from laboratory research if it's been done for mosquitoes and then for ticks. And that's how you read that string of numbers. And you can also search by the um, uh, EPA registration number, which is on the can, or you can search by the brand name. But like I said, what you are looking for is the active ingredient. You can look for IR3535, which is the other one that works really well against ticks. And the other one that you can look at is you can look at oil of lemon eucalyptus, which is a new kid on the block. Now that doesn't mean you can't use DEET, but if you've been having problems with DEET-based products and they're not working very well, try changing it up and see if you can use another one. Also, just a tip on DEET, um, up to 50% DEET you'll get better protection, but beyond 50%, you don't get anything any better than the 50%. So why would you pay for a higher percentage or why would you use a higher percentage? Okay. Oil of lemon eucalyptus, we mentioned that lasts a little bit less time and you're not supposed to use it on small children. And obviously you always wanna go through general safety precautions for repellent use. Now, there is another product that we see a lot and Moses mentioned it, I believe Dan did too. And that's the active ingredient called permethrin. That is not a repellent. That should never be placed on your skin. This is a pesticide. And you can use this to treat your um, clothing or your boots, etc. But you need to wait for it to dry before you don that. And it should never go on your skin. And there's also, I'm just skipping through this here for those of you who are not speed readers, there are other things that you should be adhering to. For example, this guy doesn't have any gloves on. No! This person is spraying their clothing inside. No! Take it outside and do it right. If you've ever seen the Martians from Sesame Street where they go, nope, 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 that is a definite thing to keep in mind. And there's a protocol when you do launder um, pr products that have been treated with permethrin, even though once it dries, it's pretty solid. It's not going to go anywhere. Wash the stuff separately and not with your tidy whities Also, you can get some great permethrin-treated groovy gear. Um, one of the things that Moses does, which I think is absolutely brilliant, is that he buys the little sweatbands uh, like the tennis player hat, tennis players have, he will spray it down, let them dry, and then he can use them on his wrists or his ankles, and that prevents the ticks from wandering too far around. And then you've got um, the, uh, the tick gators that can be treated too, and you can wrap those around your legs. Um, and you don't need to wash either of them, and that will protect you for a certain amount of times. Time. Cats can have a sensitivity to permethrin, so when you're treating your own stuff, if you're doing so, make sure that the kitty cats are locked up, because once in a while, they will get in the mix. Citronella. Oh, it smells good, but not so swell a repellent. Only lasts for an hour, if it even lasts that long, and there are not a lot of studies on ticks with it. Okay, so meet your two new best friends, masking tape and... Lint roller. Never go outside without these. I mean, you can wear the masking tape as fancy jewelry if you want, or you can stick this out on the side of your head if you want. But anyway, these are going to be very good because if you go through a bunch of tiny little ticks, you are never going to be able to pick them all off, no matter how accurate you are with those tweezers. But this, you can just go swipe, or you can take a piece of masking tape, wrap it backwards, and go bang, 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 and they're all stuck to the tape going, hee, hee. So it's a great form of revenge too. The other thing you don't want to go out without is your monocle here, your magnifying glass, makes you look like a detective, which is cool, and a pair of fine nose tweezers. So anyway, things to carry with you. Also, you can wear boots or tick gaiters, which fit over your boots. You can wear your socks over your pant legs and then wrap a band of masking tape inside out, but don't buy your socks like I do from the dollar store, because if you hold them up to the light, you stretch them on cheep, 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 
and those chip, chip, chip socks will allow the ticks to dart right through those openings, and likewise grommets and stuff on your shoes. Stay towards the center of the path. I mean, the lone stars will obviously follow you around, as Moses said, but it'll keep you away from other ticks that are questing on the grasses and shrubs. Um, wear tightly woven materials when you're going out. Even pantyhose will help. And check yourself and your gear and your pets, pets frequently for ticks. Don't fall into the trap of saying, I've sprayed myself, I am safe. Okay, and check your pets frequently. Now, you need to check yourself too, nooks and crannies. And if you don't have someone to check your nooks and crannies for you, my goodness, and it's the children's hour too, you got one of these lighted mechanic mirrors. You stand in front of one of the mirrors on your closet door and you take a look. Otherwise, you're gonna be very unhappy because they will get in your buns. All right, there are those cheap, cheap, cheap socks I was talking about. And here is Marie Boulier, who's one of our team. She's all dolled up and ready to go out and look for ticks in her environment. And you can see she has light colored clothing, solid boots. She has her masking tape, she has her tweezers, and she has a tick checking flag, which I have here in case I need a sudden dressing room. But you can drag this um, either across the grass or the shrubs, and it'll tell you if the ticks are there, but it will not tell you how many are there. And usually you wanna wait for it to be fairly dry, maybe like 10 o'clock in the morning and a sunny day before you go out and do this. When you're looking for ticks in the landscape, you wanna select an area based on three questions. Is the area considered a high risk area frequented by people or pets? Is it an area near where deer may be bedding, traveling or grazing? Are small mammals like mice, groundhogs or raccoons seen in the area? If you can answer yes to one or all of those questions, that's the area that you are going to look. And of course you can make your own tick checking device by taking a white flannel pillow case and stapling it to a broom handle when you wash that water only because ticks will sometimes respond by running away from fancy laundry detergents that smell nice. If the ticks in a single sample exceed between five to ten nymphs, you have adults or nymphs, you have a hot spot for ticks and should take appropriate protective measures when entering the area and you're going to drag about ten paces to get that sample. If you want to get the ticks off the flag or off your gear or off your clothing, throw everything in the dryer on high heat for about an hour. If your dryer is really uh, heavy duty, it might be less time, but that will dry out the ticks. Never in the washing machine first because they can survive, believe it or not. And don't flush your ticks down the toilet because they can survive that too. So when you reduce ticks in the landscape, remember that 70% of the ticks are usually found within three yards of the edge of a turf area. They love to hide in leaf litter um, for uh, deer ticks. If you provide a three foot wide wood chip barrier or plastic sheeting between an open and wooded area that helps to reduce tick habitat. They don't like to cross that. Lone stars, not so much. They will cross that. Ground covers will set it again and consider modifying your pedestrian pathway so they're at least three feet wide and discourage deer traffic by fencing, discourage small animals, etc. Now, the slippery slope of landscape treatments um, for ticks, as we said, they're really in those areas which transit from grass to woodland uh, a lot of times. So you're Control efforts should concentrate on the area between the edge of the woods or the edge of the lawn. Hey, there's our upstate cabin. No, sadly not. It's a picture from the internet. But there are two zones. There's a zone that's right around the foundation, commonly known as ring around the foundation, for those of you who remember the old whisk commercial. And then there's the outer perimeter. And Moses um, was very good about explaining how we need to really pay attention to both perimeters. When you use the um, organic type products, uh, like it's the oils, et cetera, because you have a little bit less reduction, those are best used around the house where they're more likely to be encountered by um, children or animals. And then around your outer perimeter, you can go with more traditional products. But again, it may not be as much of, of an effort as you uh, think they are because you want to make sure A, that the ticks are there, and B, that they haven't, um, when you spray, you paid attention to weather conditions. Uh, uh, time or, okay, I will stop. Okay, I think yes. that's where we're at our time, so thank you. All right, you. that's Barberry. Yank it up. Okay, done. <laughs> but you're the most, you're such an interesting speaker. I'm so sorry. It's the worst part oh, of the moderator. Fine. Don't worry. <laughs> but Don't we worry. have some questions, and I think the most recent question actually would go to you, 
Um, and that would be from L. Weitzman um, saying she uh, just bought Bugs Away that is supposed to be a tick repellent clothing. Can you tell me if it works? It seems to help. What's the active ingredient? Is it permethrin? I would guess that it is because most of the treated clothing is permethrin and it will say right on the label what it's been treated with. Does she know? That's a good question. And here um, she said yes. Okay, yes, that should work. And there should be literature included with the clothing that says how many times she can wear it, wash it, etc., before the effects of what it's been treated with sort of wear off. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Uh, so Carla Ash, I think this would go to Dan maybe. Um, do the larvae carry the same diseases and as frequently? If that wasn't already answered. Okay, I think in general, I think the answer is uh, they can, um, and they generally do not carry it as frequently. Uh, they, they have a second chance of acquiring it from a, another host, and, uh, and so that's why the adults generally carry it at a higher rate. So that's a kind of a generalization, but I would say that's, that's going to be more or less accurate. Mm -hmm. and, and Carla has a second question is, does permethrin work against larva too? And Moses, you want to respond? Uh, yes, yep, it'll work against larva. It will work against um, any species of tick and any stage of tick it encounters. Excellent. And then Beth Ann Block has a question. Uh, I have a ton of ticks on my property. I use tick tubes and I have a property professionally sprayed from March until the end of May. But I'm afraid to spray beyond that date because I need uh, the bees in my garden, my vegetable garden. Do you have any suggestions? Um, so I'm, I'm fine with taking that. Um, I'm actually a beekeeper myself. Um, I have seven hives down here in Long Island, about 15 in upstate New York. Um, if you're applying any tick product, uh, your professional applicator should be aware, and there are New York State laws on this, you do not apply to um, flowering plants that bees and other pollinators visit. So um, one, he should not be applying it to your vegetable garden. Um, those types of products are not labeled for food products. Um, so he should know that and he shouldn't be applying it to begin with. Um, and generally once these uh, products dry, uh, they're of relatively little um, harm to pollinators when they contact them. So um, that being said, uh, if you are concerned about spraying at a later date, um, just work with your pest control operator and make sure that they're not uh, treating around those plants that the bees would be visiting. And um, you would be perfectly fine treating into um, September and October when the adults of the deer tick are active. Thank and you. Moses, I want to ask you, what about fencing? Uh, we didn't really talk about fencing to keep oh. out the wildlife that are hosts for, for ticks. Uh, what, is your, what are your thoughts on using fencing to control ticks in landscapes? Um, it, they generally will work uh, fairly well. And by fencing, um, you generally, if it obstructs the view, so if it's a wooden fence, um, that's better. It minimizes the deer from jumping. Um, deer on their own accord, they have very poor de uh, depth perception. So in some cases you can get away with um, a two or three foot spacing on a double split rail fence. Uh, but for most uh, homeowners, you can get in a six foot fence um, that's uh, wood or something of that nature. And as long as the deer don't know what's on the other side of the fence, they really won't take that leap and jump unless they're very, very hungry. So um, in most areas, it will work fairly well to minimize deer access to the property. And you see eight foot fences in a lot of Eastern Long Island because the deer can see through the, the uh, mesh and, uh, but they will not jump an eight foot fence almost never. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, they, they can. <laughs> if yes. they want to, they can, but most of the time they won't. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, most of the time they won't, so. Okay. We have a, a question from John Klanowski who asks, are all insects killed by the spraying for ticks? <laughs> Um, for the traditional products, um, if it contacts uh, most of the insects, yes, um, they are a general use um, type of insecticide. Um, that's also part of the reason why they can work for a week or a week and a half, specifically on ticks. Now, one thing to consider when you're applying these, uh, when, you, when you yourself are applying these as a homeowner, or if you have a pest control um, company doing this, you need to treat the area where the ticks spend the bulk of their time. So that's the leaf litter and maybe three or four inches above the leaf litter, that's it. There's really no need to treat two and three foot high on your ornamental plantings. Ticks spend a, a very small amount of their time functionally questing. 
So um, there's no reason to put product up that high where other where it could potentially contact other insects that you don't want to target. So again, you can work with your pest control operator and make sure that they're targeting just the area where the ticks are. And I'd like to add just that a big point of what Moses is all about and doing is to try to find alternatives to some of those broad spectrum kind of materials that are more indiscriminate. He's really looking for things that are, will be a little more surgical in their removal of the uh, tick annoyance. Uh, so that's a big part of what he's trying to find right now. Mm -hmm. And we hope we hope it succeeds. I know you're making some progress, so and uh, yeah, we, we appreciate all to, that. Yeah. yeah, we were able to still do field trials this year, um, even despite all the COVID issues. So we uh, we were fairly lucky there. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Wonderful. And we have a final question uh, again from Carla Ash. And what role do the birds play, either carrying or eating? Yeah, I don't know, Moses, do you want to talk about that a little as you feel yeah. comfortable with that? Yeah, so um, the, the birds play a very large role um, for deer ticks, for the larval and nymphal stages in particular. Um, and they, they're they basically your, your long distance taxis for ticks <laughs> across the board. Um, you will have lone stars that also feed on various bird species and they will be um, transported that way. Um, but the primary species that uses birds as transport uh, would be deer ticks, but at most um, hard tick species will feed on birds to some extent, so. Thank you, and I, I have uh, just a personal question for Tamson. I know we've talked about um, the most common ticks that are on Long Island, but I'm hearing there are new species that are becoming more prevalent that we need to keep our eye on, right, Tamsin? Can you I'm glad you asked. Mm -hmm. number, number one is the Asian longhorned tick, and that's the one that was discovered in New Jersey, but recently they had a report of the Gulf Coast tick in Connecticut. And that one is another sort of exotic for this area because usually they don't come up this far north. I do have some slides on my presentation about the Gulf Coast tick. The Asian longhorn tick is probably a more pressing one for us because it has the potential to carry a lot of disease and it doesn't so far, as far as I know, but it also is a big problem on livestock. And the longhorn tick is very unusual because it has a triangular shaped head. It looks like it's got the flip, like the hairdo from the late 60s and early 70s. So if you see any ticks that look like that, let us know. And how about wild turkeys? Um, there's a question here. Do wild turkeys help with you know, tick population down? Hey, Carrie, uh, they're carried around. They're, uh, the uh, Lone Stars are carried around by the ticks. Yes, Moses? Yep, yep. Um, the Lone Star tick also has another common name, uh, the turkey tick. So the, yeah. the turkeys, <laughs> yeah, most stages of the Lone Star tick can be found on turkeys as well as um, deer ticks. So. But Moses, I think I hear people saying that they, they're blaming the turkeys for having introduced the ticks. I think part of it is just that they're seeing an increase in the turkey population. Mm -hmm. At the same time, they're seeing Lone Stars. Are they, are they really uh, guilty as charged or do you feel that the turkeys are just, it's just a coincidence that we're seeing more uh, ticks along with the higher turkey population? Um, it's, it's more of a coincidence that uh, the deer are the drivers um, for all the uh, tick species that we have mm -hmm. here on Long Island. So um, the turkeys are certainly an alternative host, um, but as far as um, the, the best quality host around, that An abundant one too. population, yeah, that will be the white-tailed deer. And, and the deer are extremely abundant, so they trump the, um, the, the, tick, the, uh, the turkeys in that regard, I would think. Mm -hmm. Yep. <clears throat> And I know some people will have um, <clears throat> birds on their property, chickens, pheasants, um, to help quelch the tick population. Turkeys do this, have the same role um, as far as um, being a predator to the ticks? I, I know that turkeys have a very wide territory. So <clears throat> have the potential to spread them. And they'll, they'll eat ticks, but I don't think they, you know, they'll eat a lot of other things too. So yeah. I don't know if they're if they're in a small area and contained. I mean, they might clean up that area, but I think also they'll eat a lot of other things as well. Yeah, so yeah. they're not a real effective predator. Not sufficient to really uh, control the problem at all. Yeah, <clears throat> unfortunately. Yeah. The, the one thing I will say um, with uh, chickens and other 
um, <clears throat> animals like that, they will tend to shred the leaf litter and dry out the area. So if they're in a consistent location long term, um, yes. their effect on the moisture may reduce tick populations over time, but the, the birds themselves don't eat enough ticks. And they're actually really bad at targeting ticks on, on their own um, to okay. effectively reduce the populations. Mm -hmm. so. so guinea hens and all that. Yep, yes. all of them. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you. Okay, great. Well, I would like to thank you. If there's anything else the panelists would like to say, I know we went over just a, a, a hair. Just and protect you yourself and, don't, and go out and enjoy the beautiful place we live in and, uh, and don't let ticks uh, uh, get to decide. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, yeah, right now we're in um, larval season for Lone Star, so um, bring your lint roller. <laughs> um, uh, but other than that, yeah, we still have a lot of uh, wonderful places to visit outdoors here. So, you know, get out and use them. Use your repellent and uh, protect yourself in that way and enjoy. And as I say to my students, stay on the trails and do your tick checks every night. Mm -hmm. That should help you too. Well, I, I want to thank you for having me part of this. Tamsin, thank you for recommending me. It was nice meeting you, Dan and Moses. And um, I really appreciate um, how much I learned tonight. So thank you very much. Yeah, and I'd also like to add my, my thanks to all of you for being a participants with us um, as one of our Zoom panels. Um, hopefully our audience learned quite a bit. I think they did, um, did a great job. We really appreciate it. And I also wanted to let everybody that was listening know that we are gonna be posting um, a video of this panel very soon on the blog page of our website. So if you're interested in catching more information, um, from from the presentations, please check the blog and you'll be able to get that information there. So at this point, I want to say good night and we'll see you next time. <laughs>